everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. The Alumni Career Pathways Series is a collaboration presented by the Alumni Relations and Career Development and Work Integrated Learning Offices. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that this panel is being moderated on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, who are the rightful protectors and guardians of this land, which is marked on a map by Vancouver. To introduce myself, my name is Sara Mulchen. I'm an artist here in Vancouver, where my work dissects private and public disclosure in parasocial relationships. I represent the Alumni Relations Office here at Emily Carr University, and I am an alumni myself, graduating in 2015 with a BFA in Visual Arts. The Alumni Career Pathway Series has been created in collaboration to help mystify, demystify different career paths for both current students and early career alumni. Tonight's panel highlights animation and the multiple career pathways available to animators. This panel is being recorded and will be available to watch afterwards on the leeway.ca under resources. The leeway is the social and professional networking site accessible to all Emily Carr University community members. Students who sign up for the platform between now and the end of reading week will be entered to win an Opus gift card. At the end of the series, all episodes will be available on both Artswork, which is the student and alumni job board, as well as the alumni website at ecuaa.ca. I'm delighted to introduce Shannon McKinnon, Director of Career Development and Work Integrated Learning. The Career Development and Work Integrated Learning Office works with alumni and students to assist them with their professional development through one-on-one -on -one advising sessions and co-curricular activities. Shannon will be moderating tonight's panel and introducing our panelists. Over to you, Shannon. Thanks, Sara. That was a lovely introduction. Um, so, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, this evening, we have an amazing panel comprised of animation alumni here to talk about their career pathways and professional journeys. But before we start, I'd like to um, I'd like to just find out who actually is going to be watching this. And uh, so we've put together a panel um, a survey. So if you don't mind taking a minute just to fill that out. So we just want to know uh, what who our audience is comprised of, whether you're students, alumni, or faculty. Okay, great. Okay, that's awesome. So it looks like we have uh, 20 students here, three faculty and three alumni. Wow. Great. Okay, so alumni start talking about your career pathways then. <laughs> so, um, here we go. All right. Um, so, um, so here's, I'm going to go over generally what the format of tonight's panel is going to be to give you an idea of what to expect. So we're going to take a few moments for each of the panelists to briefly introduce themselves and tell us what year they graduated. And um, if you would like more information about uh, this in the evenings, if you want to ask more questions or anything like that, um, also Sarah will be putting up a link to their bios in the chat. So after that, we're going to, this is going to be followed by a series of topics for discussion. And then lastly, we're going to have breakout rooms so that you'll have an opportunity to talk to the different panelists one-on-one -on -one and um, be able to ask some questions. So um, great. I'm just going to jump right in here. Um, so tonight's panelists are Christopher Ochter, Ren Budd, and Alicia Steinberger. Um, and we might have Stephanie Blakely joining us later, but we'll see. Uh, anyways, I'm going to jump right in with the questions. Uh, the first question I'm going to put to uh, Alicia because Alicia and and then we can just go through for each of you. So please share an introduction to your current work. So talk about uh, your current work or projects that you're working on or things that you're proud of and that your, your recent achievements. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so I'm Alicia, uh, I graduated in 2019 uh, from the animation uh, department. 
I guess. <laughs> and um, uh, since then, I've been working uh, in VFX, so in at Scanline and now at Braun Studios. And um, at Braun, we're currently working on a full CG show uh, that is based on Aesop's fables. So it has a lot of creature and character animation, which is really fun and super cute. Um, and I'm also super uh, excited about my personal projects. So I'm actually working together with my friend Robin. She graduated from illustration, also from Emily Carr at 2019 as well. Um, and she uh, is directing uh, a documentary uh, around a little oink bank pig sanctuary. So they're um, a, a farm animal sanctuary here in BC and they mostly rescue farm animals, but uh, uh, like but also have goats and hens and all those kind of animals. And it's just really, um, I'm just super excited to use my skills to help tell stories and maybe share information um, that maybe most people don't really know about. Uh, it's just very exciting for me. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and let me go through. Ren, you're next. <laughs> Hi. I'm uh, Ren Bud. I graduated 2015 from the animation department. I, um, I'm a 2D animator and TV at Atomic Cartoons right now. I started out actually wanting to do storyboards and then not liking it when I actually like, got a storyboard job. Um, so I ended up switching over and applying for animation jobs. I first got a job at uh, Global Mechanic doing a web internet series called Ruff Ruffman Media Genius. And then from there got onto Atomic Cartoons on a show called Cupcake and Dino. Um, and then after that, I was on the first season of Molly of Denali. And now I'm on my third show at Atomic, which is called Trolls Trollstopia. And it's connected to the 3D movies, but it's a 2D show. <laughs> And that one um, is actually airing right now on YTV here and then Hulu in the States and Peacock, I think. Um, other than that, I'm really proud of me and my friend last year pitched a show to the studio. Um, and that was a really fun process. We got like, there's a really great pitching program in Atomic because they're wanting to hear like about in-house talent to try to like produce shows that way. So I got to like, we put together all the characters and made a whole pitch package and then got to pitch it to the development team. And it didn't go through, but it was still really fun to do the, uh, the pitch. And I've already started working on a second pitch because it's, it, it's a fun process. Great. Uh, and Christopher Octor. Oh boy. So we have to go all the way back to 2002. When I <laughs> well, welcome home. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so that in, 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 the, in that time, uh, Martin was still teaching us on the um, uh, shooting under film and, um, but we were making the big transition to computer animation and um, yeah, and, and still doing traditional animation. Um, so I've been around uh, uh, a fair bit, but I, I think I, uh, in terms of reaching goals that I set for myself coming out of school, I'm starting to hit them now, um, such as doing projects with the National Film Board, like The Mountain of Skana, which was my first um, short animation uh, that I directed. Um, and then the next step was actually something that came out of the blue. It was. Um, it was doing a documentary, a short documentary, and that was uh, called Now is the Time. And it was from a time 50 years ago uh, when the Haida people, um, uh, we hadn't been doing our carvings, we hadn't been doing our totem poles, and this was the first totem pole carved and raised in 100 years, in a century. And um, they had all this beautiful footage that they captured 50 years ago in 1969. Um, but at the time, it, was an, it, it wasn't an Indigenous director that, that did it. It was an Indigenous person that got the crew there. But um, the, uh, this Haida woman, Barbara Wilson, didn't get to make the decisions on how the film was going to end up. 
So she saw it 50 years later and she didn't like it. So she asked the NFP, can we do something about it? And the NFP said, yes, we could do a new film. And I had just finished the Mountain of Skana. So they asked me if I would be willing to give, give it a shot. And, you know, I hadn't done, um, uh, done live action before, but I saw the, the, the footage and the story's a story. And, and this one really intrigued me. It was part of my history that I didn't know. And it gave me a chance to really discover it and learn it. And uh, now it's really kind of set me off on a little bit of a different trajectory in terms of what I'm focusing on. Like right now I'm in development on my first um, feature doc, but just because it's a doc, it doesn't mean that you don't, like I'm still incorporating animation and you bring those kind of instincts to, to the filmmaking process. And, and in a way, you know, maybe you could create something that's a little bit more unique or just something that's a little bit different. So, yeah. Well, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing with us. Yeah. Um, so the next question, um, I guess we'll just keep rotating the way we are. <laughs> so, um, Alicia, uh, what experiences have had the most impact on your artistic and professional development? Um, so I think for me, a lot of uh, the people around me have inspired me a lot. So while I was uh, in university, uh, all of my uh, friends from university, we all inspired each other, I think, uh, uh, like stylistically, but also like our passion for animation grew kind of together. But also uh, after leaving university, um, uh, what motivated me more was finding something that I was some uh, a subject that I was very passionate about. So obviously I love animation and combining it with something, some stories that I really want to tell and to share with the world uh, really drives me to make better and more impactful um, animated shorts or, or like just little scenes. Uh, for me specifically, it's um, to try to give a voice to the voiceless, I guess, um, or to share uh, unseen things by the public, uh, mostly about animal agriculture and how a lot of cruelty goes on in there and stuff. I just want to share it so that people can uh, potentially be more compassionate uh, and just uh, in general, like it, it just motivates me to continue with animation and, and grow. And then hopefully one day I could potentially do some big projects to share stories. That'd be very fun. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Ren, what experiences have had the most impact on your artistic and professional development? Well, I think like in childhood, it was media that I would consume and consume as excessively, uh, you know, like the Disney films and Pokemon, Digimon, all of the cartoons, Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, growing up and that's kind of what drove me into animation first but then very similar to Alicia um, when you get into school and you meet people who are so like-minded and you get to know everybody else's art style and just like being in a creative community around other creative people just kind of like you want to you want to play in that space with them and like Get, even getting into the industry, most of my friends are all people now from like from either work or funny enough, a lot of them are Emily Carr grads, but just other years for me. There's something about Emily Carr grads. They all like <laughs> find each other one way or another. Um, and so, yeah, just like some of the best people I've met um, who make me want to uh, get better so that I can, you know, we can all like share ideas and uh, share our art together and yeah, get, in, get inspired. And like the thing about being on a animation team is it's it's a team effort. A show can't get made on one person alone. Like auteur theory is dead when it comes to kids TV. You can't just one person do the whole thing. So it's like this great feeling of everybody together working and you wanna be good at what you do so that you you're not being a hindrance on anybody else and that, you know, you're all working to work together for that goal. And so you're like seeing other people's animation when you're doing your shots, cause you're going in, like you can look at a, other people's shots in an episode and be like, 
oh wow that guy did that run cycle really well how did he do that and just like frame by frame by frame by frame and go okay like there's the bounce squish there's the overlap there's the secondary movement all that stuff and it just makes you want to be, be better um so yeah i'd say that people around me boring oh, answer but yeah uh and chris yeah um I think the biggest influence on me in terms of, and uh, I guess uh, experience building is um, uh, with uh, filmmaker, uh, series creator, Loretta Todd. Um, she's done a lot of uh, uh, series work for APTN, the Aboriginal Television People's Network. And she's since uh, put out her, her first feature film. Um, and so, I started having a relationship with her early on um, in terms of um, um, getting on with her series. And that's been that's been the biggest one because uh, she would have this little segment in her series where it'd be like, she needed like a one minute animated short, um, maybe two minutes. And, you know, at first it was just do the one for the one season. And then she got another, another season. She'd asked me for two and, and then it would start ballooning one, one year. I, I think I did eight or something like that. And all together, there must've been about 24 of these short animated films that I did for her. And they were great because I mean, the budget was, was so minuscule, but the, the takeaway was that you would get these stories and it was up to me to come up with the style and the backgrounds, do everything in terms of the, the animation. And you do it as kind of, kind of quite quickly, but you would make mistakes. I, I, I would make mistakes, but I would also get, oh, that really worked and that looked good. And it was just a slow buildup of, of what worked, what doesn't, do, do a little more of this. Okay, maybe stay away from that a little bit or work on that a little bit more. <laughs> and it really helped me. And so it all that kind of led up, plus all the studio work and stuff that I combined to do and all that clay, all that stuff piled on kind of helped me when I made um, the Mountain of Skana and then you know, now kind of as I go along, creating more of these these films that I'm I'm, I'm doing. So it, yeah, it, that was the biggest thing for me was having all this this um, experimenting and practicing on these short little films to kind of yeah hone my craft. I guess that's great. Um, well. I'm just gonna stick with you, Christopher, okay? Since we're there, I'm here with you. So I'm gonna, this next question is for you and then we'll just rotate it through again. So uh, what is the best practical advice you would give to someone starting out? Or alternatively, what is the best piece of advice you received that you can pass on? Well, I think in terms of first starting out, I, I, I do feel I had a bit of a slow start and I think it was because of myself. I, I, I had this view, this dream, I guess, in my head. Because I, I remember before I went to Emily Carr, I was at high school and I knew I wanted to do animation. Um, and I would hear these stories. Oh, this, this young person got picked up and went straight to Disney and stuff like that. So I had this dream in my head that that was going to happen to me. Um, and so I... As nice of a dream as that is, I think it's important to kind of, to pursue it yourself and make it happen yourself. Don't wait for someone to kind of, to wait for that phone call that someone saw your work from somewhere. Um, just try to just just be as persistent as possible. Um, once I realized that wasn't going to happen and I really need to kind of shuffle and, and move, and um, I harassed um, this this one um, studio. Um, I, I would, I was, I, I remember being up in Whitehorse playing at the all native ice hockey tournament up there. And I was calling from a payphone, like every, I was actually stuck up there because my truck uh, lost its transmission and they, they had to get trucked in from California. So I was, I was there for two or three weeks more than I thought I would be. So I was calling every, every other day, this, 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 um, this producer and, you know, do you have anything for me? Can I, and she, and I just wore her down. And then by, by the time um, it was time for me to come back, she said, yeah, okay, you could come in and, you know, we'll, you could do some cleanup animation. And this was on paper and it was Dexter's laboratory, which was really cool. And I lasted two days 
I bombed. I couldn't do it. I, like I prided myself on being the, this this drawer, um, but I just couldn't do it. My hands were shaking. I was going through all their paper, and she's like, "I'm sorry, it's just not going to work." And you know that could have been the end of my career right there. But I guess there's that that whole thing about persistence, and I guess knowing that yourself, okay, that just wasn't for me. That was just you know a little hiccup in the road, and just keep 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 going. And those chances that other opportunities will come. And your teachers are the ones that I, I found kind of gave me the most kind of little, little help, little push and stuff. Marilyn Cherenko, she, she got me uh, my first job at um, the National Film Board, um, just doing some development art for a project called Na um, um, How People Got Fire. And um, yeah, so that was my, my my, my little entry into the NFB and then went on to other things. But I found that teachers become, you know, you're uh, a big help and I, um, people that you could kind of turn to, I guess. And yeah, so be nice to your teachers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have pretty good faculty in animation, that's for sure. So, um, Ren. Uh, I'd say um, best practical advice I could give you is networking and that the, everybody says that and everybody hates that answer, but networking within your own peer group is what I'd probably suggest actually, because the most ways I've gotten jobs have been through people I know who are in the same peer group as me and not like because I remember being in school and people going network, 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 and you're like, um, and going to Spark and seeing people there with their portfolios and you know the higher ups at Spark and you could see like you bring them their your portfolio and they'd be like, ah, not the time, not not the moment, don't do it like that. Um, so it it was always like that, um, but then yeah through actually in practice, I have this one friend, uh, Natty, uh, and we just keep ping-ponging back between each other, like recommending each other for jobs because like my first uh, freelance gig was one that she was over in Kelowna at the time and couldn't take, so sh they, she passed it along to me. And then I started doing some um, animation uh, in-betweens for a teacher I had, um, Hillary, because uh, she had a short film and I was having troubles right at the start getting like studio work, work like steady like that. So I was just doing like in-betweens for her film. Um, and it also, it helped a lot with getting like mentally figuring out, oh, I like animation more than storyboarding, even though I should have figured that out during school, but I didn't. <laughs> Um, and so like through that, she, my friend Natty, she was wanting to come back from Kelowna. She didn't like it up in Kelowna. And so I, you know, was talking to Hillary cause it was just the two of us in this really small little studio inside of her uh, house at the time. And she was like, oh, I need a compositor. Can Natty do compositing? And so I'm like, Natty, can you do compositing? And she's like, yes. So then I got Natty a job on that short film. And then when that short film was done, uh, Natty got a, the job at Globe Mechanic first before me. And they were asking her, hey, do you know any more animators? We need more people. And that's how I got there. And then after that was about a six month contract on that, I met some more Emily Carr grads. I met Sebastian and Chloe and, um, oh, and Kristen and Sitch. Like there was actually a lot of Emily Carr grads in that. It's a very short, small production. It was like 12 or so people, maybe a bit more, but it was very small. But uh, the people I met there, I'm still friends with to this day. They were, they were great. They were so talented. And then after that six months production finished up, Chloe went off to Atomic and she got on Cup and Dino first. And then they were asking her, do you know any more people? And that's how I got over on Cup and Dino and then being in a studio helps a lot because once you're in the studio, you get to know your coworkers, you get to know more people, you can talk to the people around you and find out, oh, which shows they're crewing up when, because that's the big thing with 
in the studio is like finding when the shows are crewing up because they're not going to over production as much then like there's a big push when something's ramping up that the producers and coordinators are all just like get all the people onto the show um so through being on there I was able to go from Cup and Dino onto Molly but then my um coordinator was producing on another show at Atomic and she was looking for people and Natty was at a different studio but it was more of an independent studio and she wanted to get into the commercial industry and try that out for a while so I was able to be like oh hey I know this great compositor yeah. <laughs> and so then she got interviewed there so she got into Atomic and then she got put on Trolls first and I was still on Molly and then when Molly was finishing up it was in that weird period of time where shows weren't crewing a little bit of a panic and then talk to Nanny and they're like oh no there's there's a spot open on Trolls um, I'll get you in touch with the producer here. So that's actually what I would really say focus on is yes, focus on your networking within your your own uh, smaller group within your peers and yeah. Yeah. That's good. It's good advice. Alicia, so uh, tell us what's the best uh, practical advice that you would give someone starting out or that you have received yourself. I think there isn't that much to add to what Christopher and Ren said. <laughs> they pretty much covered it all. Um, I guess I just say like, um, if you don't uh, or don't have like unrealistic expectations of yourself, because because if you don't hit those, it doesn't mean you have failed in any way. Uh, it just means that it's a very difficult industry and it's hard to break into. Um, so just keep trying uh, and once break in, it will be a lot easier because as Ren said, the first job is the hardest one to get, but once you're in, once you know some people, it'll get much easier. And I think you guys just covered it all. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. Well, since yeah. your answer was so short, I'm just going to keep mixing this up. Here. All right. <laughs> you get to answer the next one too. All right. um, so how did you first gain, and this, it, this leads into this, so how did you first gain attention of industry studios? And how has this method changed over time for you? Yeah, so I was actually super lucky. Um, uh, Shelly, she was a student in my graduation class, um, but she actually worked in the industry for a long time and then came back just to finish her degree. And then I guess she saw that I was uh, hardworking and that I was open to uh, critique and uh, improving my skills uh, through feedback and stuff. So she thought, I'd be a good fit in her team at Scanline. So she uh, actually uh, recommended me to Scanline before we graduated. I got my interview and then I got in, which is amazing. So I think I was super, super lucky. And of course this won't happen to everyone because not everyone's gonna have someone come back to school who's already in the industry. Um, but I think uh, like Christopher said, our instructors, uh, they, know a lot of people and they're able to uh, push you into the right direction or to talk to the uh, right people to help you you know here and there and uh, I think it's super helpful to in the very beginning just to grab onto whatever you can kind of get because as I said it's really hard to break into the industry but uh, once you're in it'll be okay <laughs> yeah. and I think because I started off at a very like nice studio with amazing people. I got to meet a lot of great artists uh, and animators and I became friends with a lot of them. And here's where networking comes in. And I think networking isn't so much like a formal thing where you're like, oh, look at my stuff, you know, this is a, um, and it's not like sucking up to people. It's more like just being yourself and showing people what you're interested in and just kind of being friends. You don't have to be friends with your coworkers, but just, um, I guess being a, good coworker being easy to work with that'll show other people um, who might be looking for uh, who might be looking for artists that you would be a good fit in their team so I've never really uh, applied to any studios but always been referred uh, so it's much easier when you know a few people uh, to get around in the industry if that makes sense yeah but you're also saying too that you've created a good reputation for yourself and how you work and you know that you're 
with and so that's exactly good. That's yeah good yeah and I think it's it's a it's just good to be yourself uh, but also to uh do your best or uh, do your best efforts and then mm -hmm. I think one uh great thing that I like to do which I think a lot of my friends uh also like to do is to keep working on your own personal projects at home uh if you if you want to it, it's not necessary but it just helps you uh show people at work like what you're interested in and maybe get more of the jobs that you prefer doing so if, if you're more interested in creature animation they'll see that oh you actually do very good creature animation so they'll put you in those jobs instead of you know if you're not so interested in uh digi double work maybe yeah yeah okay great thank you um christopher so uh, I know that you've said that you feel like you were a bit of a slow start, that it was a slow start for you, but um, you know, how did you first gain attention of the industry or studios where you are now, or you know, what was kind of a, a pivot for you in your career with that? And how has that method changed for you? Yeah, um, well, it was, a, I mean, when I came out of school too, it was, it was a bit of the great transition in terms of animation from, from from hand-drawn 2D to, to 3D. 3D was taking off and the, yeah, everyone was pivoting and turning to, to, to 3D. And I put all my eggs in the basket of, of 2D. I mean, I, I love drawing and uh, that's where I, I did my, my, my grad film on. Um, so, um, but if I just listened to Leslie a little bit more in our classes. Um, <laughs> So I I felt that I needed I needed to upgrade my 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 animation my my three D skills because that's where the industry was going. So I actually applied to to Sheridan their computer animation program there. I of course I applied and then Marilyn knocked on my door. Well, she didn't knock on my door. She she called me or maybe it was <laughs> and said you know that she's working on this project at the National Film Board if I wanted to to help uh, do the, some development work. Um, so I did that, and it uh, was for about a couple of, a couple months. And then I, um, in between, I had heard from Sheridan that I that I was accepted. So I told um, the producer at the NFB and he, Sven Eriksson, and he said, "Well, you know, the, it still takes a little bit for us to get our our our, our green light and 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 whatnot. So yeah, go off to school. It's a year program." And I did, and and um, while I was at Sheridan doing my um, uh, EA Electronic Arts. They had this um, this competition come up. I saw it on the message board, and it was like uh, for all schools across Canada, um, you know, put your submit your grad film, and it was the Great Canadian Art Competition. And I submitted my film and was selected with EA's, you know, on EA's dime. Got put up at the Pan Pacific and. All right. Um, yeah, and that so that was my um, that was my my foot into the door at the studios, and I, I was offered a job at, at Electronic Arts from my grad film, and um, yeah, so it was like the NFB and and EA both at the same time, but I, I had to it was through the grad film, and and yeah, that's how I got my foot in the door. It's great story, Ren. <laughs> I feel like I already answered this question. I know. I very just, long you know, if you, there's anything you want to add, or we can move on to the next one if you want to. <laughs> I just say, like, um, demo reel is still really important. Um, that's the only thing I'd really add, like, because um, in with the jobs that I did get, I, I, it was never just the person going, oh, this is my friend. It was always like, oh, here's a name I recommend, check out her stuff. Um, we, I still had to back that up with a demo reel that was good enough to be on the show. Um, so yeah, I'd say like, and with the demo reel, you really want to focus in on one particular aspect for the job you're looking at. You don't want to just put a general like everything demo reel because the industry is broken down so much into like you're going in for that one job um so so it's like, more like I, a resume like the same as a resume or or when you're doing a portfolio it's the same idea where you're tailoring it for that specific job 
Yeah, because um, I didn't know what I wanted to do originally. I had an idea and I thought it was actually going to be storyboards. I came out of school. I think Lorelai and Martin will remember that I just like, my whole thing was like, I'm going to be a storyboard artist. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, it was on all my business cards. Um, and actually like the first one, the first job I got when doing storyboarding um, was through Martin. Um, and it was at the NFB. It was uh, working on a documentary, doing the storyboards for the live action sequences. And it was a great opportunity. Like I am so thankful <laughs> for that opportunity. It was so much fun to like actually work at the NFB, but it showed me like I, that I have like, oh, taking a script and interpreting it from scratch isn't actually where my forte is lying, isn't where I'm finding the enjoyment in, in my job. Um, I still like to do like comics on the side, but that wasn't where I found that enjoyment. Um, so even like coming out of school and going into a career path that is like, oh, I think this is what I want, but then getting there and being like, no, I don't actually want to be here. Um, it's not the end of the world because with Emily Carr, you get a, like a great set of many different skill sets that you can then refocus and like think about and be like, oh, I want to do Splat for me, it was, I want to do 2D animation. And then you heard the whole long winded thing about going from studio to studio to studio. Yeah, but thank you, <laughs> that's good. Um, and thanks for sharing that advice about the portfolios. So that's great. Um, okay, so um, Alicia, um, what has helped you to get where you are and what advice would you have for others who want to follow a similar path? Now, I feel like we kind of, we are answering, some of these questions might be repetitive, but if, um, you know, uh, what advice would you be, would you give to somebody that wants to follow a similar, a similar path to you? Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, working hard and smart is definitely important, uh, but also not, um, underselling yourself, if that makes sense. So definitely keep track of your hours. Uh, you can work eight hours very hard and then take the rest of the day off. Uh, don't, you know, work 12 hours a day um, at, because um, it, you don't want to uh, sell yourself uh, for 12 hours every single day if that's not what you want to do, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're being uh, paid by the hour, I guess, or, or per project, it might vary. Um, but just make sure that you you yourself are happy with what you're doing and what you're getting in return for your work, because I think that's very important. Um, uh, and also probably just to, uh, like I said earlier, kind of uh, keep up with your personal projects if you're interested uh, in doing that, because it'll help show if the more personal projects you make, which are things that you're probably interested in, the more others will see uh, that you're really good at this uh, and they'll uh, give you more job opportunities in specific areas that you, you're more interested in. Um, because your first job in the industry might not be your dream job, but that's okay because um, once uh, they see what you're interested in, what, what you're good at, then your dream job might come along the way. So just uh, stick to it. And uh, like Ren, if your first job isn't what you want to do, that is completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And of course, there's always, you can always change your path. And especially once you get into the industry, it's a little bit easier to kind of switch over to something else. So I actually started in um, even though my dream job was action, um, but it was just a great way to get in. And then after I was in, after three months, I asked if I could switch to animation and I showed them some of my personal projects just to show like, I can also do animation. And then, so they were totally fine with it. And that's how I got the animation job. And since then I've been moving more towards what I love to do, which is creature animation. So yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I love that. All of you have talked about that, how you started off kind of on one track and then you mm -hmm. moved in another direction. And uh, I, I think that's really exciting. And I think it's really good for students to hear that, that, you know, just because you've decided on one thing, it doesn't mean you have to stick with that, you know, to stay open. And um, that's great. Oh, there's a question here. Here's a question. Alicia and Chris have both span 2D and 3D. There is a myth that there are more 3D jobs and 3D is a career path. 
What is the perception of 2D and 3D opportunities? Where is the demand? Okay, and so this is from Leslie. <laughs> Fishko, your old prof. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so uh, Christopher. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I find that um, the industry keeps uh, kind of bouncing around. Like it, it'll go 3D for a while and then 2D. Like there, there seems to be a really, uh, 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 back and forth. So I, I think you you could whether your 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 passion is 3D or 2D or both. If you want to learn them both, then you, you could bounce around the two. Um, places like uh, Wild Brain, which I was just at recently, um, they have both 3D projects and 2D projects. And just before my contract ended, we had there was a town hall meeting, and their um, the big boss at at Wild Brain was saying, you know. Um, if you're doing 2D right now, please keep doing 2D because we need the 2D people like they're on, on their projects. They're finding it hard to find Harmony, Toon Boom Harmony animators and, and, and such. And so they're telling them, if that's what you're doing, please keep doing it or, or, or what. So I, I, I think if you're, if you're worried that, you know, like you love 2D and there's not enough 2D jobs, like, um, you know, that was recent. That was just a, a, a month and a half ago that, that, he, that, that I heard that. So, um, yeah, I think that you'll, you'll find there's, the industry is big enough now for both. Like it, it doesn't seem to be one or the other. Um, and even the video games seem to be going like a, a two D back to 2d as well with some of their side scrollers and, and, and whatnot. So yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of work out there for both, for both sides I've been finding. <laughs> That's great. Do you have anything to add to that, Alicia? Um, I think Christopher covered most of it. And I think, uh, like to add on to it, like maybe uh, location also matters. So here in Vancouver, there might be more uh, feature 3D films versus feature 2D films. But uh, in Spain, for example, there's many feature 2D films uh, that are coming out. And in in Asia, there's uh, tons of 3D and 2D feature films, if feature is what you want to do. But in TV series, obviously, there is tons of uh, work here in Vancouver, uh, like DHX and Atomic. Um, so I think there, it's, uh, and like, we're also moving between um, 3D and 2D a lot, uh, because of what people want to see. And sometimes, you know, there was a big boom in 3D, like, it's still happening, but a lot of people want to go back and watch, you know, 2D stuff because it, it's kind of nostalgic sometimes, or like it's just it's uh, it's easy on the eyes. So there's a big demand now again for 2D animation. So I think um, it kind of fluctuates, like Christopher says, and also if you have 2D skills, um, it's a huge benefit, um, even as a 3D animator, because in both my jobs as a 3D animator. I've actually gotten a lot of uh, like special projects um, from the company because they know I know how to do 2D animation and to uh, know how to use the programs like Toon Boom Harmony. So they've given me a lot of their pre anime or like their, their blocking stage drawings and stuff just to block out like how they want the hair to flow or doing character design for this or poses so that they can model the rigs after it. So it's, um, it's super fun when they know that you, you can do 2D and 3D so they can integrate that into the workflow. Um, and if you know 3D as a 2D artist, that might be helpful in some way as well. So I think uh, it, it's not a competition between 2D and 3D, I think, uh, because there's, as Chris says, there's a lot of jobs out there for both. Okay, thank you so much. So it looks like uh, Stephanie has joined us, which is great. Uh, hi, Stephanie, are you there? Hi, hi, apologies. I got held up a little bit at work. Okay, uh, well, we're glad that you're here. Um, before we move on, I'm gonna let you give a uh, quick, we're kind of midway through this. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but it would be great if you could give us a quick uh, introduction about your current work. And, oh, sure. uh, and yeah, and what kind of projects, any projects that you're proud of or you're feeling, you know, that you want to share with us? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my name is Stephanie Blakey, uh, and I'm a graduate of the Emily Carr Animation Program from 2010. I um, 
started out as a freelance animator and freelance director uh, working with clients, but currently I am a storyboard supervisor working at Atomic Cartoons here in Vancouver, um, where I started in, I think, 2016 as a storyboard artist uh, on my first show, Cupcake and Dino, um, which is on Netflix and was a ton of fun, like a really, really lucky show to work on first. Uh, then I worked on The Last Kids on Earth, which is also on Netflix, which is completely different and I learned a ton of new things on it. Uh, I made a short film after that, The Butterfly Affect with women in animation uh, and women in, Van uh, women in view Vancouver um, over the last, I think it was two years ago we started it and that is currently on its festival run, uh, winning a few awards here and there, which is great. So keep working on your, you know, on your personal work as well as your day job. Uh, and now, yeah, like I said before, I'm a storyboard supervisor at Atomic for the last year and a half, I think, until kind of the end of the summertime. Okay, so I'm going to ask you one question quickly that we kind of, we're like halfway through the questions, but I'm going to ask one that I think that uh, I'd love to get uh, your feedback on. Uh, so what's the best piece, uh, best practical advice you could give to someone starting out and alternatively or alternatively what's the best piece of advice you received that you can pass on? So Stephanie, if you can do that and then we're going to get back to our regularly scheduled questions, okay? Sure so, thing. Um, can I talk specifically to storyboarding? You, yeah, you tell us what, you know, tell us your story. <laughs> Great, um, watch films. <laughs> watch, watch films, watch live action, watch animation, find out how they work. Uh, a lot of people come into storyboards thinking it's like comic books and it is similar in some ways, but vastly different in others. So a lot of the kind of notes that I give to junior artists is to stop approaching it like the comic book and approach it more like speaking film language. So. Uh, you, you don't want to skip poses, you don't want to skip acting, it's a lot, it's broken down a lot more. But you also need to understand cinematography, choreography, acting, but being a storyboard artist is being an actor. So watch a ton of different shows, different, you know, again, live action, animation, anything. Find out what works about them, find out what you like about them, what you don't, and kind of learn from that too. And if people give you notes, don't take them personally, take them as an opportunity to learn and get better at your work. That's great, because that goes right into our next regularly scheduled uh, programming question here, which is, um, and because we are curious about this, especially with um, working in career services, uh, but it also because of the university and that it's a critique based university. So do you still access, so this is for you, Ren, because <laughs> You, I'd like to talk, I'd like to ask this question of you. Uh, do you still access or engage in peer and community critique style feedback in, since leaving the university? And if so, how has this shaped your practice? Like, do you still engage in it and does it assist you and how has it helped you? So, uh, Yeah, it's a lot less formal now because it's a lot of uh, just like the people you work with become your friends, become who you want to share your art with um, and get feedback with. Uh, so I know like when I am doing just like animation on my own, I'll just, I have a discord group with a couple friends, they're all in the industry because just the people you know end up being people yeah. in the industry. And they'll like comment and be like, oh, that, that part's really nice. Oh, this part, you know, I like, like tried this, more so it's a lot less formal it's not like I'm going to a place to get that critique it's a lot of just like searching it out through people you know in like a less formal aspect um I guess the other thing about it would also be just like when you're at work you're getting a lot of feedback like what Stephanie mentioned about uh, your notes and getting feedback you can't have an ego with in the animation industry I mean, you can, but it won't be helpful because um, you're going to get drawovers and notes and your supervisor is going to comment on what you do because we're all just trying to get to the same ending and make it the best that it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. So um, you're always learning. You, you're you never done learning. That like um, I went into the industry not even knowing how to work the puppets that we do with 2D because every a lot of things. You, you can get hand-drawn 2D shows. There are still those out there, but a lot of it is these harmony rigs. And I didn't know 
much about harmony rigs going in. So like I was learning on the job and I was learning from the people around me. It's so easy when you, right now it's a little different because we're all in our homes, but when you're in the studio, just be able to like turn to the person next to you and go like, how do you do this one thing? Um, and they can like pop over and be like, oh, it's this key thing. And you're like, oh, wow, that took me five minutes to ask the person next to me versus, uh, you know, like spending hours online, like looking for the right tutorial and finding something completely different yeah. and then getting distracted by YouTube. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it, it, there, there's two types. There's like informal friends and then there's like, there's still the structural, like your supervisor and the people in your job giving you feedback and just like don't have an ego about it because also that makes you a nicer person to work around. Yeah, that's great. Uh, same question, Christopher. Okay. Um, yes, they, 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 they still come up and um, uh, especially when you're making a film, um, there'll be those sessions where it's time to show people the film and um, and you're gonna hear, you know, just thoughts, and you know, there might be it might be specific, there might be a general section where they didn't get. Um, I know, with like on the Mount Nascana, because it was uh, a silent film in terms of no no speaking, in terms of uh, um, uh, I would get a lot of those comments back from a producer from Montreal, and and you know, be, I don't get that at all, and sometimes it would be you know, there could be some frustration and it's not in the comment, it's in the fact that you're not, that I myself wasn't able to communicate what I'm trying to communicate. So you have to find in there what it is there that's the hiccup or that they're, they're tripping up on. And you're not going to them for, okay, like how, how do I solve this? Because you're, you're the director, you're the one that's telling the story. Um, so you just go in and, and you, you, you think about it and, and you figure out how you can more clearly tell the story that you're trying to tell um, because it's got to come through you. If you, if you try to do a, a film by committee in terms of from the director position, it's going to be muddy. It's not going to come out the, um, the way I think that you go in trying to make the film. Um, uh, Bill Reed said this about uh, carving his totem pole. He says, I don't think uh, two people can create a totem pole. You need one person to design it and the other to, to follow. Um, and it's the same way with, uh, with directing a film. Um, you got to find those answers. You could ask for advice and you could ask for all these questions, but it's got to come through you in the end. It's got to come through your filter in the end in terms of directing a film. Um, and yeah, so I, I hope that helps in terms of, but that's in terms of the, the peer um, um, feedback, uh, critiques, um, and know that, you know, if, if, there, if, it's, if it's a nitpicky, if you feel like it's a nitpicky thing, like the, um, I'll give another example, um, if you'll permit. Um, and now is the time, it was a live action documentary, but I had, I had animation elements in, in it. And there's this one point where the artist Robert Davidson is in his studio, he's carving alone. And I had this small totem pole that he had carved and it, it animates across the desk like it's alive, like it, it wants to see what he's creating. Um, and some people didn't get it. And, 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 and while this totem pole is coming across, he, he's hearing his grandma's voice and she's saying, hey, Robert, are you still carving and stuff? And it, this was some archival footage, uh, archival audio, and it was you know that voice of his grandma still still talking to him, and, and, and his his work is alive, and, and this kind of this 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 moment of of artistic you know uh, realism, sur surrealism. Um, some people didn't get it, and so I get those comments. I don't, I'm not really getting that, but you know you kind of stick with it. Um, if, if you really feel strong about that, that, that one thing or those, 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 those moments. And, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing that I'll hear most often is, is that people like those moments. It's got, it adds the charm, the, the, the kind of this, this difference to this film and, and the style of the film and, and how it's, it's, it's told. Um, so 
what I'm trying to say is you, you, you listen and, but you still bring it through your filter. I hope that helps. <laughs> For sure. Of course. Um, so, um, Alicia, uh, what do you think are the biggest challenge for animators at the moment? Um, I think uh, these days uh, animation is more competitive than it might have been uh, just because of the amount of um, information we're exposed to now with, with YouTube and everyone has a computer at home and now the software has been it's been getting better so you can make things at home by yourself. So a lot more people I think are doing animation. Um, so it might be more competitive. Um, but I think this the that just means that there's more studios now opening up as well that are making more shows and more movies. So I think it's kind of like finding out uh, what specifically you want to do, uh, what a direction you want to go in, and then trying to, to get your first job there. Um, and even if you don't want to work in the industry, you can, you can do personal projects uh, or uh, try to get grants for your own films. Uh, the industry is not the only way to work in animation. And um, I think I, I'm not the best person to talk about this because I've never uh, gotten a grant or anything. Um, but I do know that many people prefer to not work in the industry, but uh, pursue their own personal projects and goals um, and to tell their own stories, obviously, which I think is really amazing. So um, I think it's finding out what you want to do and then trying to work towards that, I think would be the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, can I just add one, one, one yeah. thing? Is, um, I, sorry, um, just uh, the comments I was making was, I guess, if you're the director, but if you're in the studio working as an animator, it is important to, to um, you know, listen to your, um, your supervisor, if they want you to make that change, just make the change. Like, don't don't make a big fuss about it. Um, it's um, and also gauging the situation. There are times when you're working within the industry when you have when you've made a choice about something. Sometimes it's okay to say, "Well, I I made this choice because." Um, and it'll give you a chance for your supervisor, or the maybe it's the director or. or the animation supervisor that um, to say, oh, I didn't realize that that's actually a good idea. Let's go with that. There, there, there are those opportunities as well for your voice to kind of come in and, and, and uh, you know, that's happened before on, on, on projects where, you, you know, you have these ideas and, and you could have them kind of in, incorporated, but for the most part, yeah, like don't, don't make a big deal about changes and stuff. Like if, if you're animating and your supervisor says, ah, oh, you should change, we, we, we need it to do, be, be done this way because of this, then yeah, take the change. Uh, also, I just want to note to everyone that there's links in uh, the chat that Leslie has posted of uh, for two films, okay? Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, so, where are we here? Okay, um, Ren, do you have anything to say about what the biggest challenge for animators at the moment is? Uh, oof. I, I think the biggest challenge I've noticed between like my friends and people I know in the industry is lining up contracts because everything is contract based. You're very rarely are going to be offered a full-time position like it does happen there are studios out there they tend to be smaller studios who do do full-time work um but most things you're going to come across are all going to be contract based and lining up those contracts so that when one ends another one is starting is so difficult and sometimes it just works out sometimes there just happens to be that out there and you can fall from one to the other, but I've never had an easy transfer between shows. It's always been worrying up till the minute about where I'm going to be um, come a couple months. And then like my Molly contract, I signed the last week on Cup and Dino. It, it, was, it was the very last week. Um, and I feel like uh, between Molly and trolls there was a little bit more time but it was only about a month it was only about a month and I had been 
searching, like starting to put out feelers about where I can go after Molly was done for about like three months at that point in time. So that would be what I would say is like a large challenge because I knew a lot of people who were out of work right as the pandemic was starting, not because there wasn't work in the industry out there. There was, it was just going to be a couple months. It was trying to line that up. So, cause there was just a couple of shows that were all ending around the same time. So even if it seems like there is nothing out there, like you're putting out all your demo reels and you're applying for everything and you feel like there's nothing out there, wait a couple of months, there will be something out there. They're always going to be crewing up somewhere, but yeah, it's just that trying to line everything up so that it's, it's seamless that is so difficult. Yeah, I don't think life is like that. So that I can understand. Um, Stephanie, uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge for animators at the moment? Or in sure. Um, can I talk specifically again about storyboarders? You absolutely. Storyboarders? <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, like, like what Ren is saying, it's a little trickier now in the pandemic. Um, but I will say I have hired multiple storyboard artists during this time on my project who I have never met in person in real life and who also don't even live in Vancouver. Um, we've worked with people in Toronto and have just spoken to them kind of on Zoom or, or other video kind of calls. Um, something though that I will say if, if anyone is interested in getting into boards, uh, especially right now, is just keep working, keep working on it, keep working on your boards, keep improving them. Again, learn the film language, stay away from comics, show your work to your friends, show your work to your enemies, like get feedback on it and make it as best as it can be because I'm going through tons and tons and tons of applications and I can see the hunger in it. I can see the passion in it, but you know, this is also a business and we need to get work done quickly and we need to get it done well. So we're also looking for a kind of a specific level of, of experience or talent. Um, maybe you've never worked in boards before, but you have a really keen eye for how to do it. Like that's great too. Um, and of course, you're always going to be learning on the job too, but uh, just keep, keep working on things, keep making them and keep improving. Uh, don't be afraid to apply again. Uh, there are you know, folks who I may have turned down before who will hand in something else and I'll see an improvement and that'll be great. So don't give up. If you don't get the job the first time, uh, don't give up. <laughs> Just keep improving your work and keep showing it to people. That's great advice. Um, on that note, uh, how has the animation field evolved and uh, what advice do you have? I'm going to stick with you, Stephanie. <laughs> sure. Okay. How the animation field has evolved. Well, I mean, definitely right now we're all working from home is probably the biggest current evolution. Uh, but what that means is like what, again, what Ren was saying before, we don't really have the luxury of just turning around in your seat and talking to the person next to you about what's going on. You need to be good at communicating. And like, I know a lot of us artists are maybe, you know, more quiet or introverted or you you know, oh, I don't want to bother you. I don't want to, I don't want to kind of annoy you with my questions. No, please, 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 please annoy us with your questions, bother us. It's totally cool because that's the only way that you'll get things right. Um, and I'm trying my best to normalize that on my team too. And, he, you know, anytime you need to talk to someone, just talk to someone. It's okay. Like kind of admitting you need help is not an admittance of failure. Um, it's more like, you, you realize that you need to improve here or you're not, even if it's just, you're not sure how to use software or you're not sure if the shot works, anything. Like, you know, I, pr I probably can't give you lunch advice, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, just don't be afraid to talk to people. You need to be able to communicate clearly and efficiently. And if the answers that you're getting back, you don't understand, say that, you know? Like if someone gives you this big fancy answer and it's just going in one year and out the next, don't be like, oh, okay cool, I'll go do that now. And then you head back to your desk and you just cry on your keyboard. That's not gonna help get the work done and you're not gonna learn. You could say like, I'm sorry, like, you know, I, I don't know what a smear is or whatever it is that the person is talking about. Just ask for clarification, it's totally cool. Like I'm here as a supervisor to make sure that you guys do a good job and get better and become more confident. And then I can hands off you guys. But until, you know, you're super pros, Communicate, 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 absolutely. Especially right now when we're not working together. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, Christopher. Uh, how's it evolved? Well, it just, uh, I mean, 
been around a while now and just see the, the <laughs> software and stuff kind of keeps, 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 there's something new. And uh, so it could feel a little bit daunting in terms of trying to catch up to it. But I guess if you, you just kind of poke around and go, oh, it's not so bad. You kind of notice like it, like it, I guess in the end, they are just tools created to help us create animation and, you know, uh, visuals. Uh, so if you just view them like that, it, it, I think it becomes less scary. Like these, they, they're made with good intentions. They're supposed to be made for the artist to help create. So uh, yeah, even if, if things keep changing in terms of software, um, yeah, it's, we we got brains and it's we, we we've learned them before we could learn this new thing well that's good advice too and yeah. as you were saying you started off in 2d and then you switched over to 3d and you've gone back and forth and now you're in film so i mean you <laughs> continue to evolve <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. great which is great it's really exciting um I, i'm really mindful of the time because i'm sure that students uh would like to go into the breakout rooms and speak with you directly so I'm just gonna get to the last question here. Uh, is there anything that we've missed that you'd like to touch on? And I'm gonna leave it open to you to jump in. Well, um, I'll jump in. I, I think if, I think proposals are important. You gotta, there's some point you're gonna, if you wanna get some money to create your own films um, or your own art, you're gonna, you're gonna need to do a proposal, you need to do a budget. So there's, you know, it's not gonna be great the first time probably. So, but it's like anything, you you do a proposal a few times, you, you get a little bit better at it. And um, um, that's just something you'll, you know, whether you're approaching the NFB or the Canada Council, um, BC Arts Council, um, they usually require something in terms of what are your ideas, uh, especially Canada Council, BC Arts Council, budget, kind of how are you gonna, uh, just a plan and stuff like that. And, and they're not scary things. They're usually questions that list out and you just answer the questions and yeah. On that note, we're in our office. We're always uh, willing to help you too if you have an application for a grant um, pending. We're happy to take a look at it before you submit it just to make sure that, you know, um, you, your, your T's are and your eyes are dotted and uh, so we're here for you as well so any other alumni too? <laughs> absolutely actually oh, nice. yeah 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 come see me i'm the alumni yeah. advisor yeah. um so we, did you want to just jump in and say anything else any other uh, anything else you think we may have missed uh can i give something yeah yeah cool um i think you may have talked about it just a little bit earlier um but it was about critique and criticism and getting notes back and not taking it personally. Uh, there will be times when you're working kind of in the machine at, at, at a company, uh, there will be times that you get notes or suggestions that come back that you completely don't like, maybe not on like an ethical or moral level, but on a more story or directorial level and you don't wanna do them, but get over it. <laughs> you are not the director, unless you are the director on, on whatever project, you are not the director it's not that what you're providing is bad, it's just that what you're providing doesn't align with the director's vision. And ultimately, that person was hired for that role for their vision. So yeah, okay, you might not have been able to put that joke in, but that joke still exists. Put it in your pocket, use it on a personal project later. It's okay. It'll be okay. There'll be more work later. You can do your own projects, but just, you know, be cool about notes. <laughs> they're not, they're not an attack against you. Great. Alicia or Ren? Uh, just more picking backing off of what Stephanie was saying was like, we're all trying to get to the same outcome where it's all a team effort. You're all just trying to make this one product as best as it can be. And like, just know that like the people who are before you in the line are trying their best as well. And the people after you are going to try their best as well. So be mindful of every department. And it's so easy to get bogged down and be like, oh, this build, blah, 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 blah. But like, no, they're on a deadline too. You're on a deadline, they're on a deadline. There's only so much everybody can be doing. And we're all like, be willing to make some exceptions for maybe like this incidental build doesn't have all the head turnarounds. So what, May 
you're, that end potential is only going to be in like two shots. It would take so much time to make like a full head turnaround for that. You can do it in your shot. You can do the head turnaround yourself. Like, just know we're all trying to get to the same destination and be nice to each other. That's like the most important thing I can say about the animation industry. It's just like, be nice to each other. That's good advice. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll, I'll just add one more thing. So um, everyone, obviously, we all have our own styles and stuff. But when we're uh, working with a team under a director, uh, most times we'll be working to uh, make our styles kind of mix together. So we can't, so your shot might not be, you know, your own personal style. Um, because it has to fit into a bigger picture, but that's where your personal projects come in, where you can develop your own style and your own storytelling methods and stuff. And also, um, I think specifically for VFX films, um, the the companies that direct the films, they have a lot of money and they will spend it on the most ridiculous things, which can be very frustrating because it's like, just sit down five minutes, figure out your story and you're good. And then you can send it on to the animators. But a lot of times VFX companies don't really have a story figured out and then they send it to the animators and they'll uh, change the story and you'll have to redo things like in Godzilla versus Kong, there's two complete sequences that were like turned 180 degrees. And it's just really frustrating. But again, like everyone said, it's nothing personal. And you just got to do your job, get your paycheck, and you know it'll be okay. It's like don't don't um, don't freak out. And it's uh, it's not uh, it's not your fault. It's the uh, director's fault who doesn't get the story <laughs> figured out. <laughs> okay. On that note, <laughs> uh, no, uh, Leslie has one final question for you. Uh, so we can do a roundtable on this. So, what advice do you have about pitching? And uh, and what at Equiad prepared you for that? Well, I I think that it depends on the uh, your audience. I guess like you're going to have different opportunities. If if you're going to have it, if you have an opportunity to sit down in front of the decision maker, the producer, the one that has the you know the the, the control of whether your project goes through or not, you have more opportunity to kind or. Uh, to make an impression than if it's something that's uh, paperwork that you're just sending in, like you'll have probably your portfolio that talks for to you. But um, I find the best opportunities, we have to get through this pandemic, but um, can be when when you could see someone um, in person in the room. And then I think I think that's really how what helped me kind of uh, in terms of my first relationship with the Mountain of Skana for getting it made, I didn't even know what film I wanted to make at that point, but I, I had that first meeting with Shirley Veracruz, uh, executive producer at the National Film Board here in Vancouver. Um, and I brought some artwork in, some actually printed out, um, you know, big background that I had done uh, for another project that wasn't going to be for the NFB, but it kind of it kind of gave her a sense of what I wanted to do, what I was, what well, where where my direction was was headed, um, even though I didn't know this is the specific story I wanted to do, and I think it's probably better if you do know the specific story at that time that you want to do, but I knew I wanted to do Haida stories, focus on my Haida tradition and tell these, these what I feel passionately about telling um, and bringing out to the world. And, you know, I made an impression. So, um, so then later on, I could go back and, you know, work on that proposal in terms of this is the story I want to tell, but she remembered who I was because of, you know, the, the artwork and that first kind of impression that was made um, in that boardroom. That's good. Anyone else? Sorry, just un I'm just unmuting here as I put my hand up. <laughs> uh, yeah, pitching. I love pitching. Uh, I used to be the most shy child person ever a long, long, long time ago. I hated talking to people, hid under the chairs when people visited my house, hated it. But I somehow learned to get over it. And if you want to pitch, you're going to have to get over it too. I mean, not you personally, but whoever is wanting to pitch. Um, and having kind of a, having a good sense of humor about it will help you a lot too. 
there was a pitch that I did for a TV series and I was, I, w I don't know what it was. Like maybe I was just working too hard previously. I didn't get enough sleep. I was not in the right mindset for it. I practiced, I had it all written down. It was great. And when I gave the pitch, I blanked out a couple of times. There was, you know, there in animation or storytelling, you always had this kind of rule of three. So as I was giving my pitch, I thought, you know, the, just to kind of make something up like, oh, did you ever, did you ever think about looking at the painting of this Mona Lisa? It's so beautiful. Or maybe you're impressed with the statue of David, or maybe a third thing is literally <laughs> what I said um, in the pitch. Uh, <laughs> and I, I could taste my soul escape my body when that happened. But luckily the show was a comedy, so I could kind of play it off a little bit. And the people I was pitching to were nice, you know, not like cigar chomping kind of uh, men of the olden days. So don't do that. <laughs> if you do, then, you know, bounce back up, you know, like that, that was definitely a blow, but it wasn't the end of the world. It's okay, I'm better at it now. So for pitching, I would just say to practice, get enough sleep the night before, you know, uh, have your notes, don't give them out beforehand, make sure that you're talking first and showing your pictures, but don't give any any kind of binders or things until after it's done, because if you do it before, people, they'll just read the book. They won't listen to you. And uh, treat it like you're telling a story. Treat the pitch like you're a storyteller. You know, kind of seduce them with your words into your world. Introduce the characters, introduce the world and the stories like that. Bring them in kind of hook by hook. Um, you'll need to practice a lot. Practice with your friends. Again, enemies, anyone, just until you know it inside out and take on their advice, take on their criticisms. If you get, uh, let's say you present it to 10 people and all 10 people give you completely different advice and concerns across the board, then okay, maybe maybe you're okay. Maybe you can kind of take a look at one or two of these. But if all 10 people focus in on one thing specifically, maybe their solutions are across the board different. But if they all focus on one thing that they don't understand, then you know you need to change that. So make sure you keep developing those things. But like uh, uh, Chris, uh, Christopher was saying earlier, if you try to make something by committee, you're just gonna end up with this kind of muddy thing that you won't even recognize anymore. Do stick to your guns, do make something that's true to yourself, true to your heart, true to your comedy or whatever it is. It could be, I, I don't know, whatever you're doing, I, I kind of treat creating things like this, like I'm making this for me. I'm not making this for the demographic of eight to 12 boys, you know? I'm making something that I want to watch. And if it happens to be then, then awesome. You may need to get have that answer handy if you're talking to like, you know, stakeholders, but ultimately make something that that you love and get some uh, sleep the night before you pitch. Uh, the only thing I'm going to add, because Stephanie covered a lot, um, don't be discouraged if your first pitch doesn't work out, because it probably won't. It almost never does. I've never, like... I've heard a lot of people pitch, like talk, talk about how their pitches went and almost never does the first one go through. And that's okay, you can rework the pitch you are currently working on and you can take the critique that the people who you're pitching to give you and rework it and pitch again. Or you could just come up with a new idea. There is never going to be like, don't be afraid to pitch because you think you're going to fail. Failing is the best thing that can make you get better because it will sh learn, you'll learn from it. So yeah, never be afraid to pitch because you don't think it's gonna work out. You, they're never going to like stamp your card. There's no card that says, oh, this person didn't do a good job. We'll never hear from them again. They will. They're hungry for ideas. They wanna hear from people. They want you to pitch. Do you have anything to add to that, Alicia? Um, I have yet to do my first pitch, so I don't know anything <laughs> about it yet. Okay. But it's very, it's so good to hear from all of you. Uh, so I get a better idea as well, like what to expect and what to prepare for if I do want to pitch any ideas. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's so true too, Ren, in terms of, um, yeah, it maybe not, it, we're gonna work out the first time because you know that meeting I was talking about with Shirley, well, there was a whole bunch of meetings before that that I had um, that didn't work out so well, um, but prepared me for that meeting with Shirley where I was maybe a little bit more relaxed and a little bit more myself um, and you know made for, for a better 
um, first impression, I guess. Um, yeah. And it was, I think, hey, Martin, it was, a, we, we, we tried for quite a few years uh, with the War of the Blink, right? Uh, to get that one through. And, you know, that was, you know, quite a few years of, of pitching and trying to get it up the ladder. And just sometimes they don't work, but you learn from them. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to wrap up now and so that we can get into those uh, breakout rooms. So once again, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, and if you have further questions for the panelists, please join one of the breakout rooms and also know that you don't have to stay in a breakout room that you can go to other, um, you can bounce around and you can talk to people. And then this is our version of networking. So here in COVID times. So.